us to Matthew chapter 15. Matthew chapter 15. This morning, while they're dismissing as well, let me uh, just introduce to you a good friend of mine, Pastor uh, Bill Shaw. He's evangelist again. Uh, Bill Shaw and his son William and their friends uh, of our ministry and, of course, just wonderful people. I want to tell you, Brother Shaw has been an encouragement to me in our community. I have, uh, I have witnessed to people before and they've, I've asked them, has anybody ever shared the gospel with you before? And they've told me, well, there's this guy, and uh, he uh, meets in a church, and they used to meet in a storefront just about the same distance on the south side of US-1 as we are. And uh, I've just met folks all over town that have either been led to the Lord by Pastor Bill Shaw or, or have been witnessed to by Pastor Shaw as well. There's a man at Denny's by the name of Tom, Brother Shaw. Every time I see him, he tells me, I see Brother Shaw. And he's witnessed to him for years and, and shared the gospel with him. And then Brother Russell, that used to work at Staples over there, got saved uh, at, under the ministry of Brother Shaw. And I witnessed to Russell uh, several years before he got saved. And then Pastor Shaw led him to the Lord. And uh, so I just that thrills my heart when I preach the gospel or I share the gospel with someone. You know, I'll just tell you, I don't believe I have ever had someone approach me about, about Jesus. I don't think in my lifetime somebody's ever come to me and been concerned about my soul and wanted to share Jesus with me. And uh, so that's rare. It doesn't happen very often. It ought to happen. Everybody in our community ought to know your faces and have had Jesus share, shared with them. But Pastor Shaw is a, is a gospel preacher and has been for a number of years. Other thing I, that's the other thing I love about him. He's his history right here, this man is. He, uh, he was under Dr. W.A. Criswell was your pastor, was he not? In Dallas and one of the great preachers of America and is really one of his mentors. And back in the area of country where I grew up in Kansas, he, Pastor Shaw used to preach it, uh, in Kansas City and a lot of those areas around there and a veteran in ministry. And so thank you for being here. And, and Brother William, it's wonderful to have you here as well. But they're friends. And if you just like to learn some interesting things, and uh, you just just uh, strike up a conversation with them. They, they're they're wonderful folks, and and I hope you get to know him. But Brother Shaw's traveling in evangelism now. I haven't had time to talk much with him about that, but he's preaching and and, and so forth. And so, the Lord's greatly used him. Well, that doesn't have much to do with what we're preaching about this morning, but I wanted to introduce you folks to them in case you've never met them before. Matthew chapter 15. Matthew chapter 15. I want everyone to have a copy of the scripture in your hand. If you don't have a Bible, there are some in the chairs right around you. And we want you to see this morning that what we're preaching comes from the Word of God. Amen. Verse 1. Then came to Jesus scribes and Pharisees, which were of Jerusalem, saying, Why do thy disciples transgress the tradition of the elders? For they wash not their hands when they eat bread. But he answered and said unto them, why do ye also transgress the commandment of God by your tradition? For God commanded, saying, Honor thy father and mother, and he that curseth father or mother, let him die the death. But ye say, Whosoever shall say to his father or his mother, It is a gift, by whatsoever thou mightest be profited by me, and honor not his father or his mother, he shall be free. Thus have ye made the commandment of God of none effect by your tradition. Ye hypocrites! Well did Isaiah prophesy of you, saying, This people draweth nigh unto me with their mouth, and honoreth me with their lips, but their heart is far from me. For in vain, but in vain they do worship me, teaching for doctrines the commandments of men. Father, help us this morning as we look at your word to grasp the words of our Savior Jesus. Lord, these words were never more true than they are today. And Father, I pray that you would help us today to understand the difference between man's teachings and God's teachings. Father, help us to understand how important it is that we honor you in our heart, not just on the outward appearance. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Well, if you were here for Sunday, this Sunday school this morning, and we were talking about separation, much of what we talked about in separation this morning had to do with how you look outside. Do you know that, that uh, if you're going to look like Jesus... You're not going to look like a particular person. Uh, but there are certain things that Jesus, uh, that, that would be attributes or characteristics of Jesus, that would be held in common with everyone that's trying to look like Jesus. Isn't it true? You know, when you're trying to look like something, there's a certain dress, a certain appearance. 
The world had a holiday a few weeks ago. It's Halloween. That's the world's holiday. It's not a Christian holiday. That's really the devil's holiday. And I don't mean to be offensive to anybody here that celebrates it, but that's what it is. And uh, the, the world knows it. So anyway, they had a holiday and everybody dressed up and tried to look like something. And uh, I, didn't, I didn't read a lot about it, but I, uh, Twitter evidently was exploding with people that did offensive things. There was somebody that dressed up this year like one of the, um, the Boston bombers. Somebody dressed up like a victim. And that's sick. That's just sick. But that's what the world does. That's what the world uh, portrays and acts like. And it offended people. There was a lot of other offensive things. I think that topped the list of most offensive. A lot of people dress up like devils. And they dress up like witches and people that worship devils on the world's holiday. And so the world has a look. It does, and it has a, a way that it portrays itself. If you're trying to look like the world, you dress a certain way and act a certain way. If you're trying to look like Jesus, you dress a certain way and act a certain way as well. And I'm not going to get into all the, all the characteristics of that. It's just that if you look like Jesus, you won't look like the world. And if you look like the world, you won't look like Jesus. And those principles really govern themselves well enough that if you just filter everything through that, uh, then you'll be, able to, uh, have, you'll be able to understand exactly what you should do and how you should live and what you should look like. And by the way, go ahead and focus on that. Don't focus on what everybody else should do or look like or act like. God will take care of that. The preaching of the Word of God will take care of that. And, and God will deal with the person about that on an individual basis. Okay. That's meant to be a help to you here this morning. But the scribes came to Jesus, and guess what? They were not coming to Jesus to compliment Him or to uh, be encouraged by Him or to learn from Him. They came to Him to criticize Him and His ministry, and they came to criticize as well His disciples. Now, it's interesting in Matthew that there's a lot of emphasis put on the fact that they came to criticize the disciples. And why is that? Well, because the Gospel of Matthew is written greatly uh, to help us to understand discipleship. Uh, the first, really, ten chapters of Matthew are all about discipleship, all about the call to be a disciple. You want to understand the gospel for salvation, read John chapter 3. That's the gospel, just plain, clear, simple. As Moses lifted up the serpent in the wilderness, even so must the Son of Man be lifted up, that whosoever believeth in him should not perish, but have eternal life. For God so loved the world that He gave His only begotten Son, that whosoever believeth in Him should not perish, but have everlasting life. For God sent not His Son into the world to condemn the world, but that the world through Him might be saved. The Bible talks about how that he that believeth is not condemned, but he that believeth not is condemned already, because he hath not believed. The gospel is Jesus. That's the gospel, the work of the cross, the death, the burial, the resurrection, and looking to Jesus instead of your works, looking to Jesus uh, instead of your sin, looking to Jesus instead of whatever it is for your salvation. That's the gospel. And friend, you must be born again. You have to receive the gospel or you're not God's child. So I don't want to pass over that this morning and just assume that everybody this morning is going to heaven because of something, friend. There's an actual experience that has to happen of what Jesus called being born again. And I won't shy away from that terminology because that's what Jesus said. It's being born spiritually. And you have to be born again. You must be born again. Jesus told a religious man who knew more about tradition, who knew more about the law, who knew more about religious things than probably all of us in this room combined, Nicodemus. And Jesus told him, except a man be born again, he cannot enter the kingdom of God. And so he made it very clear. And friend, this morning, listen, don't pass over this. If this troubles you, if this bothers you, and you say, I wonder if I've ever been born again, friend, then it's your need this morning. And, and this, is, this, is, this is where you focus and, until uh, the end of the message and, and, and the time comes for you to be born again. You could even be born again in your seat this morning if you call on the name of the Lord to save you. But you have to be born spiritually. It doesn't happen. You're, not, you're born physically. Everybody does that without a choice. But being born spiritually is something that you choose to do. And it's when you receive Jesus as your Savior. And God wants you to do that. That's the message for you here this morning if that's never happened in your life. Well, you got a quick message, but go ahead and stay tuned because there's more. Okay, so now, aren't you glad, Mrs. Colella? It wouldn't be a shame to drive 45 minutes to come to church and have me preach like five minutes. I mean, too bad, wouldn't it? All right. That's the first time I've picked on you instead of Tony. Right. All right. You, you've just been upgraded. <laughs> All right. Chapter 15 and verse 1. The scribes came to Jesus, and they came to him with a criticism. And the criticism was, you know what? Your disciples don't wash their hands after the tradition of the elders. In other words, they should wash their hands. Aren't they religious? 
Are they forsaking? Are they forsaking all of their Jewishness and the fact that they're supposed to be Jews and they're supposed to be good Jews? Are they forsaking the law of God? Are they forsaking these things? And they came to Jesus, and the accusation, first of all, my friend, was not just about the disciples, it was about their master. Isn't that true? What, when someone criticizes a Christian, they're not really actually criticizing the Christian, they're actually criticizing Jesus and the work that he did in saving that Christian. Don't you forget that. Don't you forget that. When you, uh, when you, become, uh, when you become party to being willing to criticize somebody who is sanctified by the blood of Jesus Christ, don't you forget that you're not criticizing just that person, you're criticizing their master. Because if they're a lousy disciple, then he must be a lousy teacher. He must be a lousy master. And when you criticize God's child, my friend, you are bringing criticism to Jesus himself. And friend, God not only condemns it, but he hates it. Not only condemns it, but he hates it. And you've forgotten, first of all, the kind of person you were when you were saved. What kind of person were you when you were saved? Lost. And what kind of a person when you were lost? Were you when you were lost? You were lost in your wickedness and your sin. You were without hope. And every person who's ever been saved has been saved the same way. Been saved from the same thing, having the same need. We're all wicked. And, and when God saves somebody that's wicked, friend, He is in the process. First of all, positionally, He's declared them to be righteous. They are the same thing. You study Romans chapter 6 and chapter 7. They're the same thing positionally as Jesus Christ Himself. They've been adopted into the family of God. They have all the rights as heirs with Jesus Christ. They're God's children. And when God looks at them, He's not deceived about what they were. But when He sees them, He sees the substitution, the work that Jesus performed on the cross. And He sees His Son. Isn't that wonderful when God looks at you and He just sees Jesus? That's amazing to me that God could look at me and see Jesus. Oh, He knows what I am. He knows, uh, he knows what I was when He saved me. But friend, I am before God. I have been credited with the, with the, per, the person of Jesus Christ, the righteousness of Christ. And so that's what a person is that God has saved. But God's not naive about their sin. And let me just ask a practical question this morning. Would it not have been a good thing if the disciples had washed their hands before they ate? I mean, seriously, let's, let's just ask the question. Let's just deal with it this morning. Would it have not helped, perhaps, if the disciples had washed their hand before, hands before they ate? The truth of the matter is Jesus doesn't criticize them for it, and so I'm not going to either. I'm not going to say, well, if the disciples had washed their hands, then the question would never have been brought. Friend, another question would have been brought if they washed their hands. Is that not true? Mm -hmm. Listen, if they washed their hands, it would have been another tradition of the elders that they were upset about. So it really isn't the point this morning. But it's not a bad thing, we would agree, I think, to wash your hands before you eat. Not a bad thing. Brother Alex always does. Where did he go? Oh, he's teaching junior church. I like Brother Alex. You go to, to a restaurant or someplace with Alex, and you're getting ready to be seated, and poof, he disappears. Every time in here, you're, you're, it's kind of awkward. You know, somebody's going to seat you, and one of your parties, you're looking around, where's Alex? Well, I know where he went. He went to wash his hands. He's a nurse. And uh, some nurses are extra careful, and some nurses are not extra careful. And Alex is an extra careful nurse, and he washes his hands when he eats. And so uh, it's a good habit. It's a habit I should get into because my hands are usually greasy. I'm always handling something dirty. And um, I found, you know, dirt seems to me like a clean thing. You know, it's good, healthy dirt. But the truth is, <laughs> it'd be good to wash my hands, right? That's not the point. That is not the point this morning. The point this morning is not that Jesus is saying that it is better for a person to eat with unwashing hands. The point that Jesus is making is that they are making much out of something that is insignificant and making little of something that actually has great amount of significance. Okay, so here's what we want to get this morning then. What's important to Jesus and what is not important to Jesus? Okay, that's the message this morning. You want to get it this morning. What is important to Jesus and what is not important to Jesus? We see this morning that what is not important to Jesus is the tradition of the elders. Taking notes this morning, what is not important to Jesus is the tradition of the elders. Why? Well, because it's tradition of the elders. Look at this. In verse 3, Jesus said, But he answered and said unto them, Why do ye also transgress the commandment of God by your tradition? So that is the the scribes came and they said, why do, your, why do your disciples transgress the tradition of the elders? What does the Bible say about elders, by the way? You studied by elders in the Scripture, and 
honestly, they have a place of importance. And in the church, there were elders appointed in every city uh, to be the head of the church. There were pastors in the church. And, uh, and when the Bible talks about elders, it talks about not rebuking elders, but in treating them as a father. The Bible talks about obeying them. So the Scripture actually has a lot to say about what would be known before the church was established as an elder. And this would be a person who not only had age, but a person who had leadership in, in his city, leadership in his area. And he would be a person who was in a position of authority. And so the Bible very plainly talks about authority here. But the problem that the scribes have is they say the disciples are not recognizing the authority of the elder. And Jesus said, you are not recognizing the authority of God. Now, I want to point out some things that are side, uh, that are side but they're good application here this morning. It is not a bad thing to be concerned about God-given authority, that is, government authority or even elder authority. It's never a bad thing to be conscientious about obeying men. Not a bad thing. The Bible never, nowhere condemns it. matter of fact, the opposite is true. The Bible says we're to obey every ordinance of man, and elders made a lot of the ordinances. But a person who honors God with things that are outward, like washing your hands because an elder says so, but is not concerned about honoring God in your heart, it's a person that's got it all backward. And many times, their obedience in one way is rebellion in another. I see in here a parallel to what Jesus talks about when he talks about righteousness being as filthy rags. You know, the Bible talks about righteousness. You ever wonder, how could righteousness be as filthy rags? How could good deeds for a lost person be bad? Don't we oftentimes think, well, doing, you know, anytime you do something good, it's good. But the Bible says if you don't haven't trusted Christ as your Savior and you're not doing works for God, then righteousness is actually evil. So a person who does good things, who has not received Jesus as their Savior, is actually doing the good thing for the purpose of looking as though they don't need a Savior. See, I don't know how many times I've shared the gospel with somebody and they say, oh, I'm a better person than you are. And they may be, they may not be. Truth of the matter, I, I'm not really terribly concerned about that. It doesn't have anything to do with it, you see. I, I remember sharing the gospel. The person told me he goes down to Target in Coral Ridge and he, and he opens the door for people. And he doesn't get paid for it. Nobody asks him to, but he goes down to Target and while he's there, he opens the door for people. And I thought, that's nice. Probably has never made such a great impact in somebody's life that they've been forever changed by the man opening the door for them. But that was that man's reason for not receiving Jesus as his Savior. I'm a good person. I open the door for people. Now that seems ridiculous, doesn't it? But anything that we do that is a good thing instead of receiving Jesus as our Savior, which is the necessary thing, is just every bit as evil and every bit as ridiculous. And literally a person opening a door, when he opens a door in his mind thinking, because I do this, I don't need Jesus. Because I do this, I don't need Jesus. Because I do this, I don't need Jesus. My friend, that's wicked. That's wicked. The Bible says it's disgusting. It's abominable. There's nothing redeemable and nothing good in it. And so Jesus says to these scribes, He says, God commanded, here's an example of how you and your tradition dishonors God. So Jesus condemns the tradition. The scribes come and they say that the disciples are ignoring tradition. And Jesus says, your, your tradition's wicked. In other words, he says, the disciples, my disciples should not obey your tradition because your tradition is wicked. Now, we don't think like this very much, do we? We don't think like this very much. We don't think very often that doing things that are traditional are actually wicked, but that's what Jesus said. Here's a tradition he gave for an instance. In verse 5, he said, but ye, or verse 4, he said, For God commanded, saying, Honor thy father and thy mother. And he that curseth father or mother, let him die the death. Now this is in the Ten Commandments. Honor thy father and thy mother. And it's the first commandment according to Ephesians chapter 6 that's with promise. In other words, that it may be well with thee, and thou mayest live long upon the earth and prosper. So if you honor your father and your mother, you will live longer than you would if you did not honor your father and your mother. Pastor, how long does a person live if he honors his father or mother? Longer. Longer. I don't know how long, but I'm just telling you, longer. God knows, 
specifically for you what that is, but if you want to live longer, uh, you can, you'll, you'll do so if you honor your father and mother. Then the Bible says prosperously. So how wealthy will a person be or how prosperous will a person be if he honors his father or mother? More prosperous. I don't know how much to the degree or the extent, but he'll be more prosperous than he would if he did not. That's what God's law says. But the elders had a tradition that just threw that law in the garbage. They had a tradition that made nothing out of what God said. They had a tradition, you see, that said in verse 5, Whosoever say, say, shall say to his father or his mother, It is a gift by whatsoever thou mightest be profited by me. Now here's the illustration. A lot of us don't understand this, but if you study and you look at the tradition of the elders, here's what the tradition, generally speaking, taught. I know this is general, but friend, we're not teaching tradition this morning. We're teaching the Word of God. So we don't need to focus a great deal on the tradition. We just need to understand what it taught. The tradition was simply this. Because you're one of God's children, you're obligated certain things, tithes and offerings. But more than just tithes and offerings, you're obligated to take care of your parents. By the way, I feel the same way that Jesus felt about this today. Um, I personally do not see how a person who loves his parents could commit them to the care of someone else. You say, Pastor, don't you understand sometimes it's more than you can handle to take care of your parents? I know. Uh, I remember when my grandmother, who really had honored my mom, as she really was not a good mother, left my mom at the age of 16 years old. And uh, her mother had died, and her mom left her on the farm as a 16-year-old, moved to another city, would move with a man. As a child, my parents did everything they could to try to even introduce us to my grandmother. My parents uh, paid for my grandmother to come visit us. Many times they, they would buy her tickets or do things so they'd come visit us, and she just wouldn't show. She just wouldn't come. I remember going and spending a Christmas with my grandmother, and and uh, so forth but when she got to a place when she needed help my mom took care of her took her to our house and, and uh, literally and the reason my mom took care of her was because she was a Christian and because she loved Jesus and you know was able in, in that time in their life to heal their relationship and God did wonderful things really took care just healed a lot of things that weren't right but we weren't able physically because we lived in a bi-level home after a while, we weren't able to have my grandmother live with us. And so what we did was there was a very nice facility around the corner from our house, and my mom put her there, and my mom went to see her constantly and made sure she was taken care of and, and just took care of her. My mom did a terrific job taking care of her mother. And I know sometimes maybe you couldn't have your parents live with you because maybe you don't have the facilities because of needs that they would have. But, friend, you wouldn't just you go over here and take care of yourself or let someone else take care of you. But that literally is what was happening here with the traditions of the elders. See, to honor your father and mother many times would be very costly. It would take your finances and your resources and literally could financially ruin or break you. And so instead of honoring their father and mother, here's what they would do. They would dedicate. <laughs> they would dedicate their funds to God. And so they couldn't spend it because it wasn't... They couldn't spend it on their parents because... It was dedicated to God. And so because it's God's, they couldn't take care of their responsibility. Sort of like bankruptcy today. I don't mean to offend this morning, but you ought to think about that and consider it. Um, I'll just tell you something. I, I have no criticism for a person who's gone through bankruptcy, except I would say I don't think I could do it. I don't think I could do it. You say, Pastor, you've never been in that position. It's because I don't think I could. See, and God's protected me from it, I believe because of that. I don't think I could do it. What it is is dedicating something. I know people in bankruptcy, boy, they, they start giving things away. This is yours, and this is yours, and this is yours. Why? Because they, they don't want the people that they're actually obligated to give them to to get them to them. They borrowed money. They're not paying the money back, and so instead of paying the money back, they're dedicating it to something, and they get to keep it. And our government says you get to keep your house, and you get to keep your car, even if you owe somebody else for it. And it's not right. It isn't right. And uh, you say, Pastor, why are you talking about that this morning? Well, because it's a good illustration of what Jesus had a problem with the tradition of the elders for. In other words, Jesus didn't seek out the scribe and say, Okay, guys, I want to talk to you about one of your traditions. This scribe came to Jesus and said, Your disciples aren't washing their hands the way our elders said they should. And Jesus said, well, Let's talk about your elders and their traditions. Instead of taking care of your parents and obeying God's law, you dedicate it to the temple and transgress. And you're going to call me wicked? See, friend, they're talking about the Son of God. They're talking to the Son of God, and they're calling Him wicked. 
They're not making accusations against his disciples. They're making accusations against their teacher, their master, Jesus. Before you get too far into criticizing them or thinking badly of them, think how often we do this sort of thing. How often, instead of focusing on the wickedness in our own heart, we focus on the wickedness in somebody else's life or what we want to perceive as wickedness in their life so that we don't have to look at ourselves. And Jesus got right to the point with the scribes. He said, your tradition's wicked. Now let me say something else to you here this morning. I, since I'm saying things that are offensive, might as well just go ahead and pile them up and then you can forgive me all at the same time when you decide to do that. Uh, <laughs> this morning, okay. I hope you understand I'm jesting about that. Um, today, there is a trend in Christianity to go back into Judaism. It's called Messianic Judaism today. In other words, it's going back into the traditions of the elders instead of honoring God. And I mentioned this as I was preaching through Jude uh, some years back. And two weeks ago, a man called me, and he was so angry he couldn't talk. He was just yelling on the phone. And he called me a pork-eating pagan. Um, I do eat pork. Uh, that is true. <laughs> so I'm partly guilty. Uh, I didn't know what he was angry about, but he was, he was yelling at me. He was very angry with me. And he was part of the Messianic movement is what I found out. And I, I preached about it. And somewhere on the Internet he'd heard a message I preached about. He was very angry at me for saying that Jesus Christ established the church. See, this is the church age, my friend. And a person who disrespects the church disrespects God and Jesus. I'm a church person. I'm not ashamed of it because Jesus is about the church. It's his bride. And so there are Christians who call themselves completed Jews. By the way, that's what I am. I'm adopted in, man. I'm... I'm reborn. I claim the little bit of Jewishness I believe I have, and then it's sanctified. I've got some pagan pork eating in me, too, that got <laughs> sanctified as well. Christian, it didn't offend me to be called a pagan pork eater because I know what I was before I was saved. I was just a wicked sinner in need of God's grace. And so I'll, you can call me whatever you want to. I'm not much of anything. The only thing I am is what Jesus made me to be, and that's something, but it's not because of me, so you can't hurt me too much by calling me things. Anyway, I yelled back on the phone and I didn't yell because I was angry I yelled just so he'd hear me and I said get your Bible out I dare you open your Bible and he yelled and yelled and yelled I said I dare you open your Bible get a Bible let's let's get the Bible out let's talk about this with an open Bible and he yelled some more I said get your Bible out and he hung up <laughs> so I called him back and he didn't he didn't block my call like smart people do when they yell at me so I called him back and I said listen listen friend I assume you're saved and uh, and uh, I said, let's, let's get a Bible and let's discuss it. And he said, well, show me one verse in the Bible that says it's okay to eat pork. And I thought, well, are we talking about salvation here or are we talking about pork? Which one is it? So I took him to 2 Timothy and I showed him where the Bible says every creature of God is clean if it be received with thanksgiving. And I took him to Colossians chapter 3 where the Bible says, let no man uh, deceive you. It talks about holy days or new moons or Sabbath. Then it goes on to say... Uh, forbidding to eat certain meats which God hath called clean. It is not, it's an, that's an uh, unexact quote. I could have taken it in 1 Corinthians 5. And then guess what? He didn't have anything else to say. He said, well, you know what? We need to call and we need to go into this conversation at another time. Now, I say that all to say this. The man's caught up in a Christianity, quote-unquote, today that emphasizes the traditions of man and de-emphasizes the Word of God. And this book is God's Word, my friend, and this book is God's authority. And these scribes that came to Jesus who were lost did not come seeing their need for Jesus Christ. Instead, those same individuals came to Him criticizing the only person in the world who could have saved them because of the tradition of their elders. And Jesus said that tradition of your elders is wicked. It's wicked. Period. He said, you hypocrites. He talks about Isaiah chapter 29. Well did Isaiah prophesy of you, saying, This people draweth nigh unto me with their mouth, and honoreth me with their lips. But their heart is far from me. Christian, 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 listen now, will you? God's all about the heart. God is all about the heart. Now you say, Pastor, that means I can do whatever I want to and all God cares about is the heart. Friend, if the heart's right, what you do will come in line with that, actually. 
So your actions will follow what's in the heart. Matter of fact, Jesus goes on to say later on in this same passage of the Scripture, He said in verse 18, But those things which proceed out of the mouth come forth from the heart, and they defile the man. For out of the heart, verse 19, proceed evil thoughts, murders, adulteries, fornications, thefts, false witness, blasphemies. These are the things which defile a man, but to eat with unwashed hands defileth not a man. Christians, sometimes we focus too much. Sometimes we focus too much on tradition, on do or don't do, thou shalt or thou shalt not. And thou shalt are in the Bible, you see. See, Jesus didn't say, don't worry about the law. He said, why does your tradition contradict the law? He didn't say, cast aside the law. He said, your tradition makes a mockery of the law. And that's exactly what tradition does because tradition is focused. Mind this now. Tradition is focused on man and what man thinks and on man's approval and how man approves. And friend, God focuses on the heart. We've learned this in the Scripture so many times. You remember David? Remember when, when Samuel was going to anoint a new king for Israel? And God came to the brothers, the sons, brothers of David, the sons of Jesse. And every single one of them looked like a king. Every one of them looked like a king. And as they, they would come and they would stand before Samuel, Samuel would say, Lord, this is the one. Boy, look at him. Boy, I mean, he's sharp. He's kingly. I mean, if any man is going to stand in the place of Saul and be king of Israel, this guy could do it. Man, what a good-looking guy. What a kingly-looking guy. Look how smart he is. Look how he acts. Each one of them, Samuel thought, this could be king. And God said, uh-uh. They don't have the heart of a king. And then God said, I've rejected them, because man seeth not as the Lord seeth. For man looketh on the outward appearance, but God looketh on the heart. And friend, this morning, as far as I know, you're just as lovely as you can be. Just as far as I can tell, you're just as good a Christian as you could possibly be because that's all I can see. And I want to tell you something. As far as what you actually are, I really can't tell. I can only tell what I can see. If this morning you do something wicked, I'll know where it came from. The Bible said it came from the heart. So I'll know what's in your heart on the basis of what you do. But if you don't do anything terrible this morning, and if you act right and you say the right things, as far as I know, you will be just as clean as a whistle on the inside and on the outside, but there is somebody here today who knows exactly what you actually are. Amen. And that's the Lord Jesus Christ. Amen. And you are what He believes you are, not what I believe you are. Isn't it sad that we spend so much time impressing? You say, Pastor, I don't care what anybody thinks. Then why do you live where you do, drive the car you do, act like you do? You say, because I like it. No, a lot of times what we do is because of our neighbors. A lot of times what we do is because of how we're trying to portray ourselves. And the truth is that we ought to be acting like we are because we want to please our Savior. There was something Jesus knew about His disciples. Something He knew about His disciples with the exception of one of them who He said He knew had a devil, was a devil, Judas. Jesus knew Judas' heart, didn't He? Mm -hmm. With the exception of one of them, Jesus knew the heart of every one of His disciples. Simon Peter was the fellow that Jesus said, you'll betray me before the cock crows three times. Mm -hmm. But Jesus also knew who Simon was and he restored him after that betrayal. See, Jesus knew that his disciples knew him, that they knew God. And their hands weren't a concern to him because their hearts were what he was concerned with. And it may be this morning that you think that God is all concerned with performance, with how many times a week you do a certain thing, with how uh, well you look to other people. And friend, what comes from the heart will create actions, no question about that, but what comes from the heart is what you are. And that's exactly what Jesus sees you as. The pastor sees you as a wonderful, terrific, nice, kind, lovely Christian. But Jesus sees you as what you actually are. He knows it. And that's what you are. And if this morning you think it's more important to wash your hands than keep God's law, you've got the same problem the scribes have. You're unable to see Jesus for who He is. And because you're unable to see Jesus for who He is, 
you see yourself as better than you are. And consequently, you'll come to the place where you'll actually criticize people that Jesus knew to be better than they were. Isn't that convoluted? Isn't that terrible? Literally, here are some of the best people in the world. Listen, I, don't you hope, wouldn't you wish that if you were alive during the physical earthly ministry of Jesus, that you'd be one of the 12 people in the world chosen to be a disciple, an apostle? Those are the people that were being criticized. Now you say, Pastor, if you read their lives, you know they were just human. I know. I'm glad for that because, boy, it would discourage me otherwise. I could never, uh, I could never measure up to them being perfect. They, were, they all had their things, their areas of sin, areas of weakness, the areas of, uh, that they had to grow. But Jesus knew their heart and he was pleased by them. He was pleased by his disciples. You could be here this morning and maybe somebody here today doesn't think much of you. Shame on them. They don't have the right to look down on you. They're acting like a scribe. But you know what really matters this morning is what God thinks about you. You know, if you were honest about it, you and God both know what that is. If the scribes wanted to be honest about it, they could have just said, you know what, I'm less interested in knowing Jesus as my Savior than I am interested in being able to show that I don't need Jesus as my Savior. You might be here this morning, you never trusted Jesus as your Savior. You've always wanted to look like a Christian. You'd, you're too ashamed to ever admit that you're lost. See, that you actually need to be saved. You'd, you'd say, Pastor, if I this morning, if I did what you said the Bible teaches about being born again, people would think that I was lost. Friend, you'd be part of a crowd of 100% of people who have ever gotten saved. No one's ever gotten saved who didn't know they were lost. And so that would be pretty normal for you here this morning. And, and you ought to be uh, like the disciples and not like the scribes and set aside your tradition this morning and just receive Jesus as your Savior. God loves you. Oh, God loves you. You can't believe how much God loves you. He loves you so much Jesus died on the cross for you. And He made it possible so that without you performing any kind of good works or keeping any kind of tradition, you could simply receive Jesus and the work of the cross. That's how much God loves you. And it might be that you're here this morning and rather than receiving God's love, you would just look at the disciples and say they're not much. <laughs> oh, you could look around this room and... And if you were to practice hard or educate yourself, you could find a reason to look down on any of us here. It'd be easy for you to do. You'd say, I'm better than... And you could just go down through the room and you could find an area that you're better than every one of us. Even Brother Randy. But you'll never be better than Jesus. Mm -hmm. And you'll always need Him as your Savior. And that's the message for you here this morning. Friend, what are you in the heart? As God looks at your heart, what are you? Mm -hmm. What do you see yourself as? What are you? Father, Lord, this message this morning is so simple. Jesus is so clear in how he presents the problem that these scribes have. And yet, Lord, they couldn't see it. Father, if there is someone here today that's just blind, help them to realize they're not blind because... Jesus is so hard to understand. And they're not blind because Jesus is such an imperfect Savior. But they're blind because of the hardness of their heart and because they prefer the traditions of men to the Word of God. Lord, I ask that as, as you are our righteous judge and as we will all stand before you as our judge, I ask that you would help us to acknowledge that here this morning. Father, if there be a person in this room this morning that doesn't know Jesus as their Savior, Lord, I ask your Spirit would just witness that to them right now. That right now, as, as we begin the invitation in our church, Father, that your Spirit would speak to them and show them that they have a need to receive Jesus as their Savior. Lord, to the Christian who is here this morning who has more characteristics of a scribe than a disciple, Father, I ask that you would help us to understand that Spirit that exalts the traditions of men and looks down on the Word of God, how wicked it is and how that you condemn it. And I pray that you who know our hearts would reveal that to us and help us to be able to find forgiveness for it and to be changed. We pray this in Jesus' name. I want to begin an invitation here in just a moment. But before we do that, I want to just explain our invitation to you. Maybe you're here and you say, I've never been to a church that does something like this. Or maybe you have before and you just don't quite understand it. I want to explain it so that everybody understands what it's about. The invitation is very personal. An invitation... Uh, particularly in a church service, is never general. It's not an invitation to the assembly. It's an invitation to the individual. So the invitation, first of all, is for you. You're here this morning, 
and you wonder, who's pastor talking to in the invitation? Who's he inviting? Well, you, that's who. I want to make sure that's clear. Sometimes we, we don't uh, think through things and we're not as simple as we ought to be. But the invitation this morning for you would be really one of two things. If you are here this morning and you do not know that you've been born again, friend, God wants you to be his child. Jesus wants to be your savior. And the invitation's a time we would invite you as we begin to sing just to move forward. I'm going to have Brother Chris come stand up here by me. And if you need to be saved this morning, you just get out of your chair, out of your seat. If you're a lady, if you're a man, come see Brother Chris. And he'll have somebody show you how you can be 100% for certain that you're on your way to heaven. That's the invitation for you this morning if you're lost. And then if you're saved this morning, the invitation would be for you to respond to what God has said to you. It may be this morning as we've looked at the Word of God, God's Spirit has spoken of specifics to you. See, I won't pretend this morning to know what the problems in your heart are. I don't know. But God does and God's Spirit does. And He's helped you by telling you what those things are. That's God talking to you. So during the preaching of God's Word, He actually, by His Spirit this morning, spoke to you personally. That's wonderful, isn't it? That God loves you enough to talk to you personally. But God doesn't talk to you just so that you can hear Him talk. He talks to you so that you can listen and respond. And the invitation is a time for you to do that. And so in just a minute, I want to ask that if you're able to, that you would take the Blue Hymn books, open to page 321. We're going to sing Nothing Between My Soul and the Savior. And as we sing, if God's spoken to you, go ahead and do business with Him. You're not saved. You're here this morning. Come forward. If you're here this morning, you need somebody to pray with you some, about something or hold you accountable about something. You come and take advantage of that opportunity. As we sing, as God's spoken to you, you respond to His Word. <laughs> 